Hello, this is Fred Kusumoto from Heart Rhythm Society. I am your representative voice this year as your president. But you know, the fun thing about this, this gives me the opportunity to talk and listen to our members uh, in, in different ways. And all oh, you have recently gotten together with all of us at Heart Rhythm Society in Boston for the scientific sessions. You know, this is now something that uh, we can really talk about sort of online and 365 days out of the year. And so I am lucky to have uh, Ed Cronin uh, with me. Ed, could you introduce yourself? Thanks, Fred. Um, Ed Cronin from uh, Temple University. I'm an electrophysiologist. Um, I'm delighted to join you. Recently attended HRS and um, delighted to discuss the, the meeting. Yeah, wasn't that great Ed, to be able to get together and actually see each other three dimensionally as opposed to this two dimensional stuff, even though, you know, we're all getting used to this zoom and it really extends our reach. Clearly, you know, interpersonal reaction is so much stronger when it can be in person. So Ed, uh, you were just at the meeting. What uh, excited you there? What was something that uh, you really thought was neat? Yeah, well, apart from, as you say, just the fact of actually being in a meeting again and meeting people face to face, which I think was just the best thing about it, potentially. Um, one abstract that really impressed me um, because it was so practical and had some really good take homes um, was an analysis of the rapid trial uh, that was presented by Khaldun Tarakchi, who's a, a good friend of mine from Cleveland Clinic. Um, and he looked at uh, not the randomized endpoint of the trial, but he looked at the anticoagulant and antiplatelet therapy that the patients were taking at the time of the procedure, and then the impact of that on hematoma. So it wasn't a, a randomized endpoint, but it was really well collected data systematically, very high quality collected data collected by many research coordinators um, around the world. Um, so you know you're dealing with very good kind of ascertainment of cases and of, of complications. And he basically found that, you know, my, my take homes from it were two, number one, if the patient is on a DOAC coming up to a device procedure, that it's very reasonable to hold the DOAC for a couple of days beforehand, perhaps, or a day before, a day after, something like that. Um, that wasn't standardized, but, but obviously that was associated with a much lower risk of hematoma, uh, which is important. And um, the other thing, and I think, you know, we've, we've all become kind of very careful or very used to operating on uninterrupted warfarin therapy, for instance, where it's harder to start and stop. But I think the DOACs present an opportunity to do that. And I think it would be perhaps mistaken if we just continue the DOAC and everybody on the assumption that it's, it's better um, than, than very brief interruptions. And the other point of it was that concomitant antiplatelet therapy was associated with a, a big increase in hematoma risk as well. And I think that's a really, uh, again, a really interesting detail that we easily gloss over. But when we see a patient maybe who's coming up for a device procedure, let's just stop and think, do they really need to be on aspirin ever? Do they need to be on clopidogrel? Do they need to be on anything? Really, if you're on a DOAC, I think the data for concomitant antiplatelet therapy, very, very sparse outside of the setting of, of a recent PCI procedure. So it maybe presents an opportunity not only to interrupt that antiplatelet for the procedure, but actually to consider, is this indicated at all? And maybe stop it altogether if there's no clear indication. I think we're maybe doing the patient a favor, not just for the procedure, but long-term. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And I mean, you know, clearly we don't recommend aspirin for primary prevention these days where, you know, we used to have a lot of our patients uh, on aspirin. And I think your point is really well taken when we think about anticoagulation and antithrombotic strategy around a device, particularly a generator change, or let's say if you're going to upgrade them where there might be an increased risk of hematoma, as we all know, those hematomas then can clearly increase the risk of pocket infection. And we just have to weigh the sort of the risks and benefits. Was there anything else that uh, you really sort of took away from uh, scientific sessions that you really thought was valuable? Sure. Another um, paper that really impressed me, I must say as well, was the PAUSE STD trial. Um, so that was presented as one of the late-breaking clinical trials by Rod Tung. And it was very interesting for two reasons. I think, number one, it enrolled patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, which is a first relief for a, a VT ablation prospective randomized control trial. Um, so that was a first, and that was very interesting to see that we actually obtained kind of similar uh, benefits with VT ablation, preventive VT ablation versus uh, control therapy, as we have seen in some prior studies that enrolled ischemic cardiomyopathy, like uh, SMASH VT, for instance, which was a similar trial, but with ischemic uh, post-infarct patients. Uh, and the other, you know, very kind of salient uh, 
feature of this trial was that it enrolled patients exclusively in Asia, which again was a first for a VT ablation trial. All of our VT ablation randomized trial data largely comes from Caucasian populations, Europe, North America. So it was great to see uh, you know, how are these uh, procedures done and how do these uh, uh, results you know, translate in other populations and also especially in the non-ischemic uh, population group in which we just have had a dearth of good randomized evidence so far. Yeah, Ed, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, thinking about doing a, you know, prophylactic ablation and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, you know, to reduce future events, I think is an incredibly, you know, interesting possibility for us to really serve our patients better. Well, with that, Ed, I just want to thank you personally uh, for being one of the pace setters. You know, as a pace setter, you were chosen because you have, you know, such an interest using social media, using uh, the internet to really bring sort of education and messaging uh, to the wider community, not only in the United States, but also worldwide. And I just want to thank you very much uh, for doing that. My pleasure. Thanks very much.